Actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life. From Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at UBNRadio.com. Real life isn't always easy. Real life brings tough questions and difficult decisions. That's why there's compassionate conversation with Catherine Tall. Say what you need to say. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, a show about life and the choices we make. Compassionate Conversation with Catherine Tall on UBNRadio.com. Hi, I'm Catherine Tall, your host for Compassionate Conversation, and welcome back. Today is a very unique and special show. I know I say every week is special because it is to me, and I hope it is to you too. But today is a unique show because today is the finale of Season 1 of Compassionate Conversation. After today's show, we're going on a hiatus for a couple of months. I'll be planning terrific new things for you for the new season with fabulous new guests and an exciting new approach. I'm really going to be encouraging you to call in because in season two, we're going to be talking directly about your relationships. And I want you to be calling in next season so that we can talk live about your relationships and help you get the help that you want so that everything is more effective and harmonious. Today with me, I have of one of the world's beloved mentors in healing and personal growth, Dr. Robert D. McDonald is my very, very special guest in studio this morning. Robert has a background that just blows your mind. He is one of the co-founders of the Institute of the former board member of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. He was one of the absolutely crucial creators of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, the Executive Director of Mental and Spiritual Wellness at the Center for New Medicine, and Robert is the creator of so many extraordinary healing methods, including the Destination Method, and he is the founder of the Telos Healing Center. Good morning, Robert. Welcome to Compassionate Conversation. How fun. Good morning, Catherine. Great to be here. It is so great to have you here. You are one of my beloved teachers and mentors. I'm so honored to have you here in the studio. And I invited you for a very special reason, because since today is the finale of season one, and I know that things are shifting for me and for many, many others on the planet. I see clients every day of the week, and everybody is talking to me about, I don't know what is going on, but it feels like something really big is changing. Yeah. And in some people's lives, that's feeling heavy and dark. Mm -hmm. In some people's lives, it's feeling light and alive. Mm -hmm. But of all the people that I have ever met, you are among the very, very few that I know that are so dialed in to universal energy and universal principles, Robert. That's why it's so special to me to have you on the show today. And you and I are going to be talking about being open to change. Mm -hmm. Yes, open to change, exactly what's necessary, particularly now, the beginning of 2014. I see 2014 as actually a fabulous new year. I'm very excited about it. But it is about change. It's completely about change. What do you see, what do you have the sense is the change that is coming, Robert? I think the change is coming, uh, that's happening for all of us, is to, the ability to go deeper in, inside of ourselves to notice that every time we want something, one specific kind of goal, whatever it might be, at the same time that we want it, there's a part of us that doesn't want it. There's a conflict at the bottom of all of our efforts. One of the things that I've developed over the years is a way to resolve these kinds of internal conflicts. Uh, I work um, all over the world uh, teaching people how to do the destination method, and I've been uh, very happy to um, contribute to a magnificent place in Irvine, California called the Center for New Medicine. And in that place, I work with uh, physical illnesses as well as uh, mental, emotional difficulties and disabilities. And invariably, whether it's in that circumstance or in one of my sem seminars or people come to see me privately, people want, on the one hand, a particular kind of change in their life. Perhaps they want more money, perhaps they want better relationship, uh, perhaps they want a physical healing, whatever it might be. At the, the, what they need to begin to understand, and I think the whole world is moving this direction, is that when we want something on the one hand, there's a part of us that doesn't want it on the other hand. And if we ignore that, if we 
fight with that, if we find an enemy within, then we create something really uh, difficult for ourselves. We actually spiral down. So one of the things to prepare for change and to be open to change is to love and respect all parts of ourselves, including the part that wants to heal and the part that doesn't want to heal. And that's why I've created a lot of uh, programs about this. I even have a CD that I've uh, created called Healing Yes, Healing No that's dedicated to exactly that kind of thing. Healing Yes mm -hmm. and Healing No. Yes, and it has to do with this whole issue that has to do with change. Uh, I really, you know, when I see people, they want every different kind of change in their lives. But when it comes down to it, why don't they have it? What stops them from having it? The, the first thing that stops people from having what they want is they don't take the time to notice what they want. They don't come home into their bodies and ask themselves, well, you know, do I want to continue to have the experience I'm having? They, they don't ask that. That's the first thing that stops uh, their development is they're not curious. But once they become curious, they say, well, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to continue to have what I have. I want something new. Well, what could possibly stop people from having the new, that next level, whatever it might be? And that is undoubtedly part of what is the source of the problem is that they're struggling with a part of them that is saying no to the very thing they want. And don't you find, Robert, that generally what stops people is fear on some level? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, fear is at the bottom of it. You know, we see in The Course in Miracles that the two emotions that dominate are love and fear. But one of the solutions to this, uh, this dichotomy or this uh, paradox or this duality is that, yes, there's love on the one hand and there's fear on the other. What do we do about them? If we keep addressing them as opposites, that they fight one another, they clash with one another, there's no place to go. But if we go beyond them, if we do something, we could call it transcend them, we want to, we could say that, uh, we, we just start to notice the positive function of each of them, we would be able to love our love and love our fear. And that's a much greater love. There's a, there's a love that transcends love and the love that transcends fear. And it's the same thing when a person has a physical uh, illness and they want to resolve it. Somebody comes and they're struggling with uh, a particular, any kind of physical illness. On the one hand, they want to solve that illness. But on the other hand, there's part of them that doesn't. What we need to do is resolve the upset that we have with the part of us that doesn't want what we want and find its gift. So at the center of real change, of really being open to change, is recognizing that there's no such thing as an inner enemy and that every single part of you is in love with you, actively in love with you. And by taking this attitude, we then address the part of ourselves that says no uh, with a loving uh, embrace, allowing us to find its positive function. And that's the way we can resolve our conflicts and actually move forward. So let's talk about that a little bit more because I think that that's a fascinating um, theory at, that we don't hear voiced very often. So even though we may hear a critical voice inside of us or a voice that's very afraid that says, no, no, don't give that up or don't do that or don't make this change right now or no, you can't move forward, you're saying that every part inside of us loves us. As I say every single part of us, every single part of me, every single part of you, every single part of all of us is actively in love with us. Now, this is contrary to the general teaching. It is actually contrary to many cultures. <clears throat> and the, the, uh, in the certain psychological culture, there is an effort to find the enemy. Yes. Uh, the, in certain spiritual cultures, there's an effort to find the inner enemy, that which is wrong with us, the brokenness. The badness, not just broken, but something bad inside. Right. So there's a continual fear and fight with oneself. So, well, if I look inside, I'm going to find out that I'm self-sabotaging. Well, <clears throat> the word sabotage comes from the French word sabot for boot. And what that meant at the time, back at the time when the, during the First World War and the Second World War, when uh, the Germans were occupying France, is that the French would throw a boot into the German military machinery, literally into a machine. And that boot would stop the machinery, stop the thing from happening, the destruction from happening, the creation of munitions and things like that, and killing machines. So when we say sabotage, we, have to, we start to think, hmm, there must be something. I'm sabotaging myself. I'm a bad person. There's something bad inside of me. Nothing could be further from the truth. And as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the dominant beliefs that has harmed the entire world of people who are interested in personal growth. It has harmed us. Because in truth, if we just take a few moments to examine it, we'll learn there can't be an enemy within us. Every single part of you is absolutely actively in love with you. Now, it may be going about its method of loving you 
in a way that turns out to be harmful. But its intent is to give you something good and wonderful. I mentioned before working at the Center for New Medicine where I work with a lot of people with different illnesses. A minor illness might be laryngitis, for example, something not so good in the people who are talking on the radio. You know? <laughs> but uh, laryngitis, well, I've, I've worked, uh, I remember many years ago, uh, I developed these kinds of uh, ideas a long time ago. I, w I worked with a woman who had laryngitis and she w was a singer. She needed to sing that Saturday night. She came to see me on a Thursday. She came to see me because she wanted to be able to sing that Saturday night and she yes. could hardly speak to me. And so what I did is I asked her to go inside of herself and talk to the part of her that had created the laryngitis. Now, her training was that, yes, there was some evil, bad, no good, rotten part of her that had caused this laryngitis, was sabotaging her career, was ruining her life. And so she wanted to address this internal part with anger, with um, a harsh tone. She really wanted to mistreat this part of her, thinking that that part was mistreating her. And what I suggested that she do, and luckily she did it, was to go in and to apologize for not paying attention. Ah. So she paid attention, she apologized, she paid attention to this part, and this part of her let her know that the reason it had given her laryngitis is because it wanted her to rest, it wanted to protect her. She had been pushing her life day and night, day and night in her career, not, not getting any rest. And so once she understood that this part of her was not evil, not bad, was not trying to destroy her, but rather trying to protect her and take good care of her, then it became a simple idea of negotiating with that part so that it could protect her without giving her laryngitis. And within a matter of 20 minutes, the laryngitis was gone. That's she amazing. Spoke, she spoke directly and cleanly from then on. She sang that Saturday night, but she had to make a promise to her unconscious mind that she would in fact rest. And that's where we start talking about the unconscious mind, the, 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 there's a part of us that actually below our conscious mind that takes good care of us, helps us, our heart to beat and eyes to focus and things like that. And we don't have to think about it. You know, our body heals, we don't have to think about it. Well, the unconscious mind is running the show, actually, running our lives. And it's a real good idea to be on good terms with it. So, <laughs> so, so, so what, what she needed to do and did, she promised that she would get rest, that after singing she would rest that sunday and monday and Tuesday. and in fact she did that but i told her i told her one of my own experiences when i told my unconscious mind that i'd get rest and i didn't and what it did is it, i became ill for quite a long time uh very serious flu which i never got before but it came as a consequence of this part saying listen it's important that you get rest don't pretend that you can jump off buildings and go up there are laws in the world and there's laws about eating, and there's laws about exercising. There's certain kinds of physical laws, just as there are emotional laws and mental laws and spiritual laws. And this part of me made it abundantly plain that I needed to take care of myself. So I say that's just a brief example, but it, it, that example applies to whether a person has a laryngitis or they have cancer. Uh, I work with cancer patients there at the Center for New Medicine. Uh, and it is possible to find out the positive function of any illness, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, whatever it might be, and thereby uh, make it plain that every part of you is actively in love with you. That attitude in itself is healing for many people. Many people in the midst of therapy, I sit down with them, start talking with them, and uh, mention, they say, well, I'm just a terrible, no good, rotten, very bad person, and I start mentioning to them, well, you know, the truth of the matter is that every part of you is in love with you, and many of them start to cry because it never occurred to them because they never believed it, because they were told forever by everybody, their family, their friends, their therapists, well, you know, you, you, there's something evil and wrong and bad about you. Well, they certainly weren't seeing me because I would have never said that Exactly, to them. exactly. So it's because not everybody buys into that, but many do. And it's of such an important uh, attitude, I believe. Uh, it's part of uh, what we call the destination method convictions. Uh, we have 30 of these convictions. and. Uh, one of them is there's no such thing as an inner enemy. Every single part of you is in love with you. And by taking this attitude, we can make astonishing changes. It, we need to be open to change. I mean, that's the topic today. Yes. We need to be open to change, but we also need have to know how. I mean, just because I'm open to change doesn't mean I know how to change. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, being open to change means I must 
recognize that um, my value and my worth and that every part of me is in love with me and then I, and then how about some methods for actual change you know what and that is a perfect place for us to take just a very brief break robert i have dr robert d mcdonald a world beloved teacher healer in the studio with me today we're going to take a very quick break i'm katherine tall licensed psychotherapist stay tuned we're coming back to talk about how do you move forward into change with dr mcdonald here we go stay tuned hi this is katherine tall licensed psychotherapist life can be complex and your thoughts about it matter if you've ever felt stuck and wanted answers i'm available to help through my private practice in Los Angeles, by Skype and by phone, and through my book, The Next Bold Step, help is available. The Next Bold Step, learning to love and value yourself and know that you matter, is your roadmap to deeper self-understanding and moving ahead. Contact me at katherinetall.com. Better tomorrows are waiting. Real life isn't always easy. Real life brings tough questions and difficult decisions. That's why there's compassionate conversation with Catherine Tall. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, a show about life and the choices we make. Compassionate conversation with Catherine Tall on UBNRadio.com. Welcome back. I'm Catherine Tull, licensed psychotherapist with Compassionate Conversation. Today, January 29th, with my special guest, Dr. Robert McDonald, we are talking about being open to change. And by the way, I want to let you know that both Dr. McDonald and I have some wonderful special offers for you that we're going to be talking about at the end of the hour. So stay with us because we're going to be offering you some wonderful gifts. So Robert, you were when we went out on the break, you were beginning to say that even though we may be able to to become open to change, that until we know how, it's difficult for us to actually move forward. So please, I would love for you to share with me and with all of the audience, what are some of the ways that we can move forward into change? Well, moving forward into change requires coming home uh, to the body as a first step. Um, If I want to change, I need to slow down. Since we were on the break, I've slowed down inside. I was very excited at the beginning, speaking with you. I'm glad to be here. And then the question is, well, how to change? What, what needs to be done? What are methods? It's very easy to talk about insight. Insight, uh, I think, is probably the easiest thing in the world, at least for me it is. Uh, I went to, before I became a therapist and I've taught therapy around the world, um, I certainly went to a lot of therapy, and what the main issue the main direction of therapy for me in those days anyway was to find out why I was the way I was yes and that was important and I was so lucky to be with people like yourself compassionate communicators people who really want to have that conversation whereby I was able to feel listened to for the first time in my life so the first thing for me was to be able to come home to my body to feel my feelings and have that happen in the presence of someone who was kind enough to listen to me and let me know that I was heard. That was very much not part of my upbringing. That's very often the greatest value of therapy Mm -hmm. is, in fact, I was just uh, working with somebody last week and telling them exactly this. They were concerned that uh, we weren't moving ahead, that they weren't attaining these concrete goals that they thought were the reason that they had come to therapy and we addressed all of those issues and I needed to reflect back to them how much progress and growth they had actually made that they weren't looking at because they were looking at the long road ahead of everything they hadn't done yet because that's what most of us have been taught to look at rather than looking at what how wonderful we are we have been taught to look for the parts that aren't there what I haven't done yet, what I haven't accomplished yet. If I didn't make the A, you know, if I got an A minus, that wasn't good enough. I should have gotten an A. So the majority of people in the world have been taught by their families and by culture to look at what's missing, not to look at what they already have, not to love themselves, but to disregard their positive qualities, focusing on the negative qualities, because that's what we have to change. Mm And so I was saying to this individual exactly what you just said, that 
one of the most important things I do with my clients is I provide that compassionate, non-judgmental witness who allows them to say what is inside that no one has wanted to listen to before, no one has taken the time or had the courage to listen to before. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it takes a lot of courage to allow another person to expose their pain in your presence. It takes so much courage for them to expose Mm -hmm. their pain in your presence. Yes, I fully agree. This is a priceless gift, what you offer to people when you sit with them and listen compassionately, hope in your heart, put yourself in their shoes, let them, let them know that you've really heard them and follow them through that kind of labyrinth of misunderstandings and understandings and beliefs and thoughts that they've had acquired over years and years. The first thing that's important is that a person be heard. Yes. And that insight emerges out of that. The natural positive result, the natural humanistic wisdom that comes out of us as our, our own human wisdom uh, is we start saying, oh, well, that's what happened. Now I, un- I have this understanding. What I love about doing therapy and what I love about the work that you do, Robert, is that I know that w- that your approach and my approach as well is not to tell the other person what they're thinking and not to tell them how to feel, but to um, somehow create a safe enough container with a little bit of shepherding mm-hmm. that allows them to get in touch. As you were saying, you use the words to come home to their body. Mm-hmm. I would personally use somewhat different words, but the point is to help another get in touch with how they feel within themselves and allow that to take language mm-hmm. so that they, in their mind, they begin to understand and they come up with their own insights Mm -hmm. that they arrive at their own self-awareness and their own self-understanding yes i think it's a natural outcome of safety without emotional safety and deep rapport uh, between two people two or more people then the genius of the individual is stifled and so and the insight that necessarily comes along with that genius is stifled without that safety so the first first step of course is having uh, rapport when it's between people in my, in, in when there's an interaction. In, in my work, what I want to do is be able to say, okay, once we have this rapport and once we have this insight, what is it that is wanted? It, insight is absolutely necessary, and as far as I'm concerned, priceless. I need it. I love it. I'm st- so happy. I'm actually shocked when I'm in the presence of someone who really knows how to listen well because it's so (laughs) seldom taught and it's very difficult to learn. Most people believe that they're experts at listening, but they haven't been taught. Really, it takes quite a lot to to listen well. Uh, As you say, courage to listen well and also skillfulness. And so a person who is being listened to needs, in my opinion, needs to discover, have skills themselves. One, come home to the body and what I mean by that is have their emotional body return to the physical body. The emotional body is commonly outside of the physical body, above the head somewhere, in an effort that the person is making to handle uncomfortable emotions. Yes. So their emotions are out of the body somewhere and I say that the emotional body is outside of the physical body. So one of the first steps on the how to change is bring the emotional body back into the physical body come home and in the presence of a really wonderful compassionate listener this is a lot easier than otherwise in fact I don't think it's possible at all in the presence of hostility but in the presence of compassion and kindness and openness and open-heartedness it's 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 facilitated so bring the physical the emotional body back into the physical body when the emotional body is back in the physical body then I can say to the person one of the five uh, golden questions that we we have these golden questions in the destination method and the first one is well do you want to continue to have the experience that you're having now they can't answer that question unless they're home and their emotion their emotional bodies home and their physical body they can't answer it they won't know if they're not sensitive if they're not home if they don't feel safe enough they won't answer it as a matter of fact uh, questions like what do you want which is uh, fundamental to all change work what do you want Uh, is an easy question to ask, but very difficult to answer and impossible to answer unless the person's home. So the first question I ask, helping people to get rid of what they don't want, I say, do you want to continue to have the experience that you're having? And if they say, yes, I really do, 
Well, then I say, well, that's fine. Then we're done. Because <laughs> I, I do the destination method. The destination method, I'm like a taxi driver. I, 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 I'm, you know, a person gets into a taxi, and the first thing that the taxi driver says is, well, where do you want to go? And if the passenger says, well, I don't know, the taxi driver says, I don't know either. That's right. And, you know, and, and the meter's <laughs> running. So what are you doing? <laughs> so... Uh, what, so what has to happen to get from point A to point B or from where we are to where we want to go is there has to be a decision about what's wanted. And that can't happen, certainly can't happen deeply, without compassionate conversation, without deep understanding. It's, it's just that's the beginning place. That's the place of the heart. That's the place of the love. We have the heart of compassion, but we also need the sword of technology, which is the method, that's why I create the destination method, is a result of the integration of the heart and the sword. Com that means compassion on the one hand, and then step-by-step -step procedures on the other to produce uh, results that are wanted. We can't do without either one and, and make a predictable change. I want to make a point about that. The heart by itself is a symbol of compassion and understanding and love and those kinds of things. And by itself, it it will be um, wonderful to experience, but it won't produce predictable change. The sword, on the other hand, will produce predictable change, but by itself, it will have no meaning, no love, no kindness, no compassion, no ethics, no morality. The sword of very strict tools to get things done uh, is like a, like a, uh, if you take a literal sword, you can cut you know, fruit from the tree and serve your neighbor the fruit. Or you can take the same sword and stab somebody. Sword doesn't care. And so, to the tree, it doesn't feel very good. The tree, yes, right. The tree, <laughs> yeah. So what, what's necessary is to understand that the, the heart uh, without the sword uh, is valuable and meaningful, but is generally powerless to get predictable change. The sword without the heart gets predictable change, but it's empty. Empty and meaningless and dry. So what and, I did. and often gets overridden by some of the buried uh, hostility and aggression that so many mm -hmm. people have mm -hmm. collected over a lifetime. And I love what you're saying. I also wrote about that in my book, The Next Bold Step, mm -hmm. because I, I spend most of the book helping people gain some insight and then begin to craft the idea of what they want, who they really want mm -hmm. to be, help them get in touch with who are you really underneath the teaching, the, the misguided information information that people gave you throughout your lifetime but the very last point that I make in the book is action mm -hmm. exactly for the reasons that you're saying because insight without action is kind of like having a library that you never go into mm -hmm. yeah I think that's literally so long ago there was a man named uh, Robert R. Karkoff long time ago and he wrote a lot about listening skills and he talked about insight and action and he said action without insight is um is barren, you know, and, and insight without action is powerless or impotent. And to me, that's exactly what you're talking about, the heart without the sword. So you can mm -hmm. have all the insight, all the love, all the compassion in the world, mm -hmm. but without some action that mm -hmm. brings it to be, that brings it mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the reality that we are living in, in terms mm -hmm. of the physical world, mm -hmm. without the action, it's an energy that the world must have mm -hmm. to sustain the positive forward movement, but the action is the positive forward movement. Yes, and, and action that's informed by and in service of love uh, is, the, as far as I'm concerned, is the best kind of action. Yes. So we produce something wonderful in the world. So uh, when I'm working with somebody, I'll ask them, you know, do you, do you want to continue to have the experience you're having? Because they've been heard and they're feeling safe, they can say, no, I don't want that. What do you want instead is the second question. What do you want instead of what you've got then? And that's harder for people. But in order to find the answer to that, they have to go inside. They can't get it from me. I, I'm helping them, but I can't tell them what to do, and I won't tell them what to do. I'm interested in knowing what do they actually want. And in the beginning, they're a little shy about it, but after a while, they may say something like, you know, well, I really want a lot of money, or I want love all the time, or I want something uh, very large, which is a, a nice beginning, because the third question is, how will you know when you have it? Yes. And that's when things begin to be more specific. We have very specific step-by-step uh, -step questioning like this so that the person can come to the ground. First, they bring their emotional body back into the physical body. They, they breathe. They're alive. They have a sense of what they feel, what they want, what they think. They start identifying what they don't want. Then they start identifying what they do want. 
and we say, okay, so how will you know when you have it? You know, it's interesting. If as a taxi driver, if somebody gets into uh, my taxi and I say, where do you want to go? And they say, I want to go to Hollywood. Well, you and I are in Hollywood right now. So you, I want to go to Hollywood. So oh, you do. And, uh, and I say to them, how will you know when you're in Hollywood? <laughs> and let's say that they're from the Midwest or something and they've never been to Hollywood. And so they say, well, I'll know, I'll know. I've never been there, but I know. So how, how are you going to know? I say, well, I'll see the Hollywood sign, you know, that great big white sign. And then I take them to Griffith Park, which is far away from Hollywood, far enough away where you can see the Hollywood sign, but you're not in Hollywood. And so what's necessary when a person starts identifying how they're going to know when they have what they want is that they slow down again. What, is, what will be the evidence that they have what they want? Yes. They say, I, you know, I want to have, have a lot of money. Well, what, when you have that, how are you going to know? Will, it, will you see it in your bank book? Will you see that in um, your bank account? Uh, and, and what's that going to give you? And they start looking deeper into the values that are motivating them toward the kinds of results that they're articulating and how they'll know. Once we do that, we get to one of the final questions, the fourth golden question, which is, well, what stops you from having what it is that you want? And typically, the person says, I really don't know. Something's stopping me. And it's my experience that what stops me and what stops everybody is something internal. It's not the external world that needs to change for me to be happy. There's only one human being in the world that needs to change in order for me to be happy. That's me. is isn't anybody else. So I need to find out well, what's stopping me from being happy, irrespective of my circumstances. Am I, what, what do I need to do? And commonly, it has to do with changing the way I treat myself, changing the way I treat other people, changing the way I speak to myself. What kind of internal dialogue do I have? Am I harsh with myself? Have I grown up believing that the only way to motivate myself is with the stick, beat myself up and criticize myself and criticize everybody else? Perhaps that needs to change. That's a really interesting point. And, and the other thing that you touched on just a moment ago is that um, so many of us have been taught to identify happiness with possession. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask somebody the question, well, how will you know when you're happy? And very, very frequently the answer has to do with, well, I'll have the big house that I dream of, or I'll have a swimming pool, or I'll get to spend a, a month in Europe, or it has something to do with some sort of a possession or an experience mm -hmm. that they're not currently having. I know very few people. I, I'm not even sure that I actually know one who as a child was taught that happiness is a quality and a feeling that comes from within you and that you don't need anything around you mm -hmm. and you don't need anyone around you mm -hmm. in order to be able to feel and experience happiness. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of the work, Robert, too, is helping people get to the point where they're willing to even accept that notion mm -hmm. that their internal happiness is not dependent on what lies outside of them. Yeah, I fully agree. I, I think when the people say, well, I'll know when I have this house with a swimming pool or whatever, that I'll, that'll be um, my evidence that I'm happy. That's simply a confusion of levels. They haven't noticed that that's their goal. That's what they want. But that's not how they're going to know that they have it. How a person knows that they have anything is through their body. Yes. What, what it is that they will see and hear and feel, what's going on inside of them. How, they'll, they'll say, oh, well, I'm, I'll have the, how am I going to know when I'm happy? I can only know when I'm happy by my internal experience. We are going to take a quick break right there. I'm with Dr. Robert D. McDonald. I'm Catherine Tull, licensed psychotherapist. Stay tuned for more compassionate conversation. Dr. McDonald is going to be telling us how do we know when we're happy? What do we feel when we feel our feelings in our body? This is Catherine Tull. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Shows that make you laugh. Shows that make you think. Music that moves you. It can only be one place. Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Real life isn't always easy. Real life brings tough questions and difficult decisions. That's why there's Compassionate Conversation with Catherine Tull. Say what you need to say. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, a show about life and the choices we make. Compassionate Conversation with Catherine Tall on UVNRadio.com. 
Welcome back. I'm Catherine Tull, your host on Compassionate Conversation, talking today with Dr. Robert McDonald, who is absolutely fascinating me with our conversation about being open to change and some of the internal steps that we go through as change is coming about in our lives, how we become open and then how we move into it. I've been so fascinated with the conversation today, Robert, that I have completely forgotten to remind and invite our audience to call in 323 Four seven eight two six. Please do call in if you have any questions or comments you'd like to ask Dr. McDonald a question directly. 323-284-7826. So Robert, you were just about to start to tell us what is it that we might actually feel in the body? Let's use happiness as an emotion that might that you might begin to describe. What might somebody feel in the body if they know that they're getting in touch with the emotion in their body? The, the only person who knows their particular brand of how they feel happiness is that individual. They have to think about experiences of happiness. So we have a catalog of experiences in our minds from our memories. And uh, ask people, well, when was the last time you were happy? What was going on externally? They'll, they'll typically go there first anyway. And then how did you feel inside? So when a person comes home to their emotional, brings their emotional body back into their physical body, they can start noticing, oh, I feel differently in my chest area, in my heart, for example, heart chakra area, or, or maybe in my solar plexus. I feel different in my throat. I feel different in my body when I remember times of happiness and joy than I do when I remember times of anger and fear. So the four, you know, the four major uh, emotional categories are sad, mad, glad, and scared. Some psychologists talk about surprise and disgust, but generally sad, mad, glad, and scared. And so well, how do I know when I'm sad? How do I know when I'm mad, when I'm scared, when I'm glad? How, sad, I'm mad, I'm glad, I'm scared. How am I going to know? Gladness, happiness. The way I know is by paying attention internally. And that means tuning out other people's voices that have been interrupting that knowledge, taking time. That's why it's so important not only to have compassionate conversations, for, but for an individual to go inside, to meditate, to close their eyes, to feel inside of themselves, to enter internally and experience, well, what is it that's happening with me now when I think about something that makes me sad? Do I feel the same, exactly the same as when I am happy about some memory? And when they start making these distinctions, which might sound to many people like, well, simple, like they really know that. But for many people, this is a revelation to simply notice that coming home to the body, the only way you can know you're happy or not happy or whatever emotion you're having is by feeling your body. And emotions live between the genitals and the throat. All emotions live there. We don't have emotions on our elbows, for example, or in our fingernails. Somebody might say, well, I feel angry all over my body. And then you say, well, really? Do you feel the anger in your big toe? And they go, well, no, I haven't quite noticed that. <laughs> so, wh well, where is it? You f I love you. If somebody, if somebody comes up to you and points to their elbow and says, I love you, I love you, this, I feel all this <laughs> throbbing love in my elbow for you, probably you'll laugh and say, you know, I don't believe that. It, I, I just don't believe that you feel love for me in your elbow. And because we expect people to express the way we've felt and the, what we've seen expressed and what we've expressed ourselves, when we say love, people will touch their heart area. They'll say, oh, I, I love you, and their hands will go to their heart. Um, because they're feel, they literally feel that. That's where emotions are felt between the throat and the genitals. I, I do have, I do, listen to me stumble. I have had the experience though personally and with some of my clients, however, that if you have been holding on to a lot of fear, doubt, worry, hesitation, confusion, uh, if you've experienced a lot of abandonment or rejection and so you feel very tentative about even experiencing relationship on any level in any setting, mm -hmm. a lot of people do develop muscle and joint pain yes. because internally they are suppressing so much emotion mm -hmm. and they are internally clenching yep. so hard that the muscles and the joints and the ligaments and there even the cartilage begin to ache inside the body yes. and the body gets sick. sick sometimes mm -hmm. because you're holding on so tightly your if your um, movement joints your elbows your knees your ankles if that's in a state of stress mm -hmm. a regular motion that would never create damage mm -hmm. does create damage mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, I know this to be so. I see it a lot in the patients that I've worked with over the past uh, 40 years. Absolutely, yes. And what, what this is a, a, a distinction I'm making is that emotions are not felt in my joints, but the reaction to the suppression of the emotion can be yes. inflammation. This is an interesting thing about uh, people in the, in the medical profession and others that say, well, you know, uh, things, uh, the only thing that causes uh, problems is something physical. Physical causes physical. I say, well, really? Every child knows that if you think about eating a lemon, you'll salivate. <laughs> and there's no lemon in the room and the person's salivating. So and thoughts, you may also pucker your lips automatically. Right. Yeah, thoughts create chemicals. Thoughts literally create chemicals that's that right. weren't there before. And, of course, they create behaviors that like pucker my lips and so on. But the point is, is that if I suppress, hold down the emotion that I might normally feel in my genitals or my stomach and my heart and my throat, if I hold it down really tight, I clench my fists, I cl you know, clench up my whole body, then I cr I'll create inflammation. Very easily do that. But it's not a it doesn't mean that the emotion is felt in those places in the feet or in the or in the hands or something. It means that's where the damage is being done uh -huh. for not feeling the emotions that are felt in yes. the body. And I know that lately you have been doing some very uh, groundbreaking work with healing allergies. Oh, yeah. And you are offering a new program around that. And believe it or not, we are already down to the last 10 minutes oh. of the show, Robert, which mm -hmm. is extraordinary. And you had some things that you wanted to be able to talk about, some programs that you have coming up that you wanted to have a chance to educate the audience about and please go ahead and tell us okay. about those new programs great uh, yeah I'm, we're very happy my wife and i uh, dr lizette mcdonald and myself we created the telos healing center out in your belinda california and we teach our seminars around the world uh, and what we're doing in southern california is uh, in february on february 8th and 9th we're doing a, a wonderful program that demonstrates some of the things we're talking about today which is how the mind actually creates the body rather than the other way around and this is a program called how to stop allergies the end of allergies so many many people ha have come to me over the years who have different kinds of allergies like to cats and dogs and to dust and to pollen and to uh, whatever it might be and they really you know to cheese to milk or whatever it might be to eggs and I sit with them and take them through a process of basically educating that means mentally communicating with their immune system so that their immune system recognizes that it's res their immune system is responding hostily to a non-enemy like the cheese is not an enemy to anybody else but if my immune system believes it is then my immune system will fight against the milk product or fight against the dust and create an allergic reaction so uh, we have two days of training on that it's an actual training it's february 8th and 9th and you people can come to that for not only resolving a, a given allergy one allergy that they bring or maybe more but also they can learn how to do it uh, now a lot of people don't want to know how to do it a lot of many people just want to experience the change so if you want to come and just experience the change then you could just come for the saturday february 8th it's february 8th and 9th you can come for saturday february 8th and just experience the change and uh, not learn how to do it whereas people who want to experience the change and learn how to do it you can come saturday and sunday so there's different prices on that but uh, because i'm here with you, you know, there's a discounted price normally this uh, would be 395 dollars for the for the two days but if if a person uh, comes uh, for the two days they can come for 350 If they want to come for uh, one day, they can come for 175 That's so, wonderful. So yeah, they just a, need to contact you, yeah. and, and we'll be giving out the contact information sure. and say that they heard about it on mm -hmm. Compassionate yeah. Conversation. They have to do that. They say that they've heard about it here on this radio. Then they, they'll get that break. Just That's call wonderful. Me, call Thank me, you. Uh, up. And we have another one called Healing Core Issues. That's a five-day retreat for people who are very, very interested in healing the core issues of their life five days it's a complete retreat we live there we eat there we have 25 people no more we don't allow more than 25 people it's uh, at the joshua tree retreat center in uh, near palm springs california and it's a fabulous five-day retreat that is dedicated to the resolution of unnecessary human suffering specific core issues that people uh, want to deal with and and resolve we actually do that there and uh, that that also has a discount uh, normally that would be two thousand dollars but um, you get like $300 off by coming um, and saying you're from uh, the UBN here, from 
from Compassionate Conversation. Conversation. That is Conversation. fantastic. So these are huge discounts that you're offering to the listeners of the show, which I really appreciate. When are the dates of Healing Core Issues again? Healing Core Issues is March 13th through the 17th. It's a five-day program. It's all day. People typically arrive on March 12th at the at the retreat center. Okay. But they, it's, it's, it's all day and into the evening. It's a retreat center where we, we live there. And the price, by the way, includes not only the course and, and several trainers, but all the food and the lodging so it's it's amazingly inexpensive we, that, that one we do just purely out of love so anybody who wants to come and enjoy that they can so you can find out more information mm -hmm. about this by contacting robert yes yes robert at teloscenter.com that's t like tom e l o s like sam center.com and uh, you can contact robert and mention that you heard about the workshops, either How to Stop Allergies or Healing Core Issues on Compassionate Conversation. And they will be, Robert and Luzette will be so happy to meet you and begin to teach you their work. And what a gift that you've given all the listeners, Robert, to offer such a, a delicious and generous discount. Thank well, you I'm so glad. much. I'm glad. I do want to mention the number they can call is 714-577-5717. And they can uh, also look us up on the internet at telocenter.com if they want to see the website and see all of our offerings that we have there. Dr. McDon the Dr. McDonald's, including Robert and his beautiful wife, Luzette, offer so many incredible programs. I really encourage you to check out telocenter.com for all the information about all their work. So it, it kind of in coming to the close of today's show, Robert, b before we sign off, I'll ask you to repeat the website and the phone number one more time. But just to wrap up this wonderful conversation that we've had today, in order to be open to change, of course, the first thing that one has to do is allow that things can be different for them mm -hmm. come, come be, home to the body and you know come home to the body get in touch with how i feel mm -hmm. and you know that is a word that is used to mean so many different things at least in the english language mm -hmm. so when you say to somebody how do you feel of course the the typical american answer is fine, fine. But what does that mean? And so when we're talking about feelings, we are not only talking about the emotional feelings, but we're literally talking about what do you feel in your body when you talk about feeling happy or sad or angry or scared? What do you actually feel in the body? I do a lot of that work with my clients too, and it always surprises me how many adults walk around and they are completely disconnected from feeling anything in their body in terms of con understanding that that has an emotional representation. Mm -hmm. So they may say, my stomach hurts, my legs hurt, my head hurts, but they've never been introduced to the understanding that that represents an emotion. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about bringing the feelings back home to the body, we're talking about literally getting in touch with what you're feeling in the body mm -hmm. and then developing the insight to listen to what the emotion is mm -hmm. that that's representing. Find out what is the emotion that the person's feeling, whatever I'm feeling, and then find out, well, do I want to continue to have this emotion? Do I want to have another one? And what, what is the value uh, of having the emotion I currently have? How do I treat myself? So centrally, I think the deepest thing for me is to the recognition that every single part of you is in love with you. Yes. Knowing this allows us to go forward into any change. We are open to change because we're unafraid of our inner selves. And this is the beginning of a wonderful transformation. That is absolutely beautiful. Every single part of you is in love with you. And that when you accept that and embrace that and really integrate that into your thinking and feeling, then you can move forward without fear because you're not disconnected from yourself and you're not afraid of yourself. You're not afraid of your inner self. You're not wrestling yourself to the ground. You can actually start moving forward and have conscious evolution, which is what we're interested in. Let's evolve consciously and in love. So say that for us one more time, and I just enjoy your voice so much, too. Doesn't Robert just sound like he's mm -hmm. been on the radio for all of his life? <laughs> <laughs> so say that for us one more time. The most important thing in being open to change is... is to know 
that every single part of you is in love with you, actively in love with you, doing the best it can to produce something wonderful. And by doing this, you'll no longer be fighting with yourself. You'll actually be, there'll be an end to that fight. There's insufficient inner peace so that you can consciously evolve to the next level to have this transformation that's just waiting for you. All you have to do is begin by coming home to your emotional body now. Dr. Robert D. McDonald, thank you so much for thank being you. my guest today on this finale Great. episode of Compassionate Conversation, bringing to a close season one. You can reach Dr. McDonald at teloscenter.com on the internet. And also, Robert, that phone number one more time yeah, phone is... phone number is 714-577-5717. And so signing off for the last time for this season, you can reach me, Catherine Tull, at CatherineTull.com. You can call me directly at 310-920-9480. It has been such a joy to be with you every week for the last many months. I'm really looking forward to bringing you season two. We're going to have a lot of wonderful, compassionate conversations and really get to the nitty gritty about your relationships too. So please stay tuned. Watch on Facebook. Facebook and on Twitter for information and update, uh, updates and the inspiration will keep going. I love you all. Thank you so much. And until I see you next time, many blessings. Bye-bye. Real life isn't always easy. Real life brings tough questions and difficult decisions. That's why there's Compassionate Conversation with Catherine Tall. Say what you need to say. Every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, a show about life and the choices we make. Compassionate Conversation with Catherine Tall on UVNRadio.com. It takes a crane to